Hello. To Muslims, Muhammad is the most important person who ever lived. He's the seal or the last of all the prophets, the one chosen by God to receive his final revelation. So to insult the memory of the prophet is a blasphemy and a body blow to the Muslim believer. It can carry terrible consequences, as the staff of Charlie Hebdo discovered when they published cartoons which were thought by Muslims to be demeaning their prophet. The Quran tells us very little about Muhammad. What we do know comes from the stories and traditions about the prophet, known as the Hadith, which were compiled after his death. Those stories provide moral examples of how to behave, but they also have an impact on all of Islamic history. Joining me to discuss how much we can know about the Prophet of Islam are Jonathan Brown, Prince Al-Walid bin Talal, Chair of Islamic Civilization at Georgetown University, DC. Said Blair, Imam and translator of a soon-to-be-published English version of the Quran, and Tom Holland, a classicist and author of several best-selling books, including In the Shadow of the Sword, on the origins of Islam. Jonathan, just how important are the Hadith to Islam? Well, they're extremely important. For example, I mean, everybody knows that Muslims pray five times a day, but uh, that's not in the Quran. That comes from the Hadiths. Hadiths provide absolutely essential information for Islamic belief and practice. Saeed, how much would we know about the Prophet if we didn't have the Hadiths? Well, we'd have a general idea, because the Quran, of course, does refer to various aspects of the Prophet's life. But we wouldn't have the detail. And the detail is all important when, after all, the Quran tells us that we have to obey the Prophet. To follow the Prophet, you have to know about him in every detail, and only the Hadiths provide us with that. So, Tom, overall, how reliable do you think the Hadiths are? Well, I think they're very reliable in giving us a sense of how Islam, over the first two, three centuries of its existence, evolved. On the question of how reliable it is as a source for the historical Muhammad and the early years of what I suppose we should call Islam, I'm more sceptical. And, and Jonathan, I suppose the Hadiths give us the ethical example of the Prophet. Yeah, they're basically just reports about something the Prophet said or did or something that was done in his presence. So you can have all sorts of material. You can have ethical material, things about how you should act, how to be polite, how to be merciful. But you have sometimes very detailed legal stuff about you know what kind of sales and contracts you can have or how a specific crime should be punished. So it's the content of hadiths can range from you know across the board. And if I didn't have the hadiths, would it be possible for me to interpret the Quran? That's actually a really big question, which has always been a big question in Islamic uh, discourse. It's actually really difficult to read the Quran without some kind of contextualizing material, and uh, that comes from the hadiths. Saib, just one other term to raise, the, the Sunnah, because we have the Quran, which is the revealed word of God to the Muslim. We have the Hadith, which are the traditions of the Prophet. What is the Sunnah? Well, the Sunnah is the life example of the Prophet, and that, of course, is made up of various aspects. For example, the Sira, his biography that we are guided by. The Hadith, uh, as Jonathan said, the Hadith are not just what he said or what he did, but also what happened in his presence. So there are different types of hadith. There are prescriptive and descriptive ones. So the sunnah is the whole totality of the life example of the prophet that should be followed. Tom, you're not a Muslim. Why are you interested in all this? Why did you spend so much time writing a book about the origins of Islam? Well, I'm interested in the whole civilizational achievement of what we call late antiquity. So that's a sort of intersectional period between the ancient world and the early medieval world. And one of the salient features of that that is a universalizing ambition on the part of many of its most learned people. So you see that with reference to the Roman Christian Empire. You see it with Judaism and the construction of the Talmud. And it's a very distinctive achievement, the formulation of the Hadiths and the Sunnah. Nevertheless, I think it emerges from a recognizable wellspring. Now, Tom, you have done a deconstruction job on the Hadiths and you question whether the Prophet Muhammad was even born in Mecca. Well, I think it's hard to say because the problem is that if you can buy into the program of authentication that Muslim scholars constructed over the, the emergence of Islam, then you can accept that we have uh, detailed accounts of what Muhammad did. If, however, you don't accept that, and I think there are very pressing reasons why, in terms of writing history, it's very problematic, then there is no alternative account of how Islam came into being. The essence of the Hadiths, it seems to me, is that it is an absorption of various traditions, religious ones, Jewish, Zoroastrian, Christian, and legal, say Persian or Roman. But because Islam is an emerging imperial ideology, ideology as well as a religion, 
the Muslims were reluctant to ascribe any of these legal systems to the pre-existing ones. And so therefore they had to ascribe it to a prophet. And the prophet in turn is the mouthpiece of God. And so therefore they are sacralizing traditions that maybe originally were not sacral. Jonathan? You know, if you look at the actual original formulation of Islamic law, actually most of the law doesn't even come from hadiths. It comes just from the juridical opinions of early Muslim scholars. So they don't even bother to say the prophet said this. So this idea that they're kind of going back and putting it in the prophet's mouth is just not true. If you look at the earliest surviving works on Islamic law, most of the time they're just saying this is my Muslim scholar saying this is my opinion or this is you know, so-and-so's opinion. They don't even attribute it to the prophet. Saeed, there has been a long tradition of criticizing Hadith. How do you determine whether one is authentic or inauthentic? Well, we approach the source material and try and understand it. And to understand it, we draw on other resources as well. Uh, so we can use all these tools, but what we can't do is use methodology that is correct based on incorrect premises. Now, if I, for example, go to California and say, I've looked everywhere for uh, any historical evidence of the existence of the Prophet Muhammad, I didn't find it, hence he didn't exist. That is a completely ludicrous premise using the, wrong, the right me methodology. So if you take out preserved material like we have in the Top Kapi Museum in, in Istanbul of letters that the Prophet sent to the contemporary rulers. If you take out the relics, if you take all the, all the material from Medina out, all the Arabic based material, and then say I'm still trying to find out what really happened. Well, it's actually so reductionist that it's no longer reliable. Tom. Well, the way that Muslims traditionally have, have authenticated hadiths is based on a sort of chain of transmission that somebody heard it from somebody who heard it from somebody who heard it from somebody who heard it from Muhammad. And that then sort of serves as an anchor linking you to the bedrock of the prophetic era. I think that what is interesting about this technique is that it closely echoes Talmudic technique, where uh, likewise you have both a written law in the, Quranic terms, that would be that would be the Quran, and you have an oral law, so that would be the Sunnah corresponding to the Talmud. And the way that the rabbis claim that the law descends from Moses down through the generations, and then the rabbis write it down. Now, I think it's very telling that Surah, one of the great centres of Talmudic scholarship, very close to Kufa, which is one of the great centres of Hadith scholarship. In Babylon. And I, I and I suspect very strongly that the whole methodology that was derived for authenticating hadiths is actually rabbinical. Except that's not true because there's no actual presentation of a chain of transmission for the oral Torah that's given until the 800s when the rabbis in Baghdad were doing that to imitate Muslims. Yeah, they had an idea of the tradition going back to the oral Torah of Moses that's passed down through the priests and then the rabbis, but they don't actually have a chain of transmission saying this rabbi, I heard it from this rabbi, I heard it from this rabbi. And if you look in the Talmud, they don't actually have long chains of transmission. They just say a rabbi so-and-so said something. They don't say, I heard it from this person who heard it from that person who heard it from that rabbi. That's yes. only the Muslims who innovate that, and then the Jews copy them in the 800s. But, but Jonathan, you, you accept that there were lots of forgeries of Hadith. There were lots of false Hadith. Of course. Yeah, definitely. That's why Muslims came up with this, what they thought was a good science of trying to authenticate them, because they were presented with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of made-up reports. And a lot of those reports come in the form of propaganda, because we know that uh, not long after the death of the Prophet came the Sunni-Shia split. And you've two different sides of an argument who are using these hadiths to bolster their own position. Oh, yeah. I mean, you could find hadiths that are propaganda for everything. You know, from the Sunni Shiite split to certain theological positions to the, you know, eggplants being the best vegetable. You can find anything. There's always some hadith made up to prove a point. But, but if, these, if these are propaganda documents, how can we trust them? Oh, well, that's a great question. You have to try and figure out how to try to decide if the prophet said it or not. And that's what Muslims tried to do from basically beginning in the, the mid 700s, the early, actually the early 700s, trying to figure this out. Tom? I think that that sort of exemplifies the problem. How how do you uh, <laughs> winnow out the false hadiths from potentially the true ones? I'm sure there are fragments of material that do derive from the time of the Prophet. But what's interesting is that often when we can identify those very few fragments, they are presented in a context that suggests that the person who is, who is referencing it has no idea of the original context in which it was uttered or written down. And because, I think that... Because presumably that they were compiled a long time after the death of the Prophet and the events that they're purporting to well, be Well, I think these sort of fragments exist there and then they get set within a specific context that illustrates what the lawyers 
want it to illustrate. The issue, I think, essentially is whether you think it is the prophet who is influencing the lawyers or whether it is the lawyers who are basically fashioning the prophet. I, I think it's the lawyers essentially who invent Muhammad. Uh, Tom, I think that's just a lot of conjecture based on almost nothing. The science of Hadith and classification of Hadith is a very thorough science, and it has come up with various classifications. For example, start with the Quran. It is an oral tradition witnessed by so many people simultaneously that we know that it is credible and reliable. But how do uh, we know that? Likewise, l let me at least explain the system, how it works. We have other classifications of Hadith. We have those that are sound, those that are of good quality, those that are weak in their chain of narration, etc. Now, where does it matter? If it's about the eggplant, whether you like it or you don't like it, it doesn't really matter. But if it comes to decisions, whether we can actually use certain rulings and apply them judicially, then it does matter, and then we have to be scrupulous about it. Well, let me remind you that you're listening to Beyond Belief, and today we're discussing the Hadiths, the stories about and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, which form the bedrock of Islamic law and practice. How reliable are they? And to what extent are these stories informing the actions of extreme Islamist groups like Islamic State? And with me are Saeed Blair, Tom Holland and Jonathan Brown. There are people who completely reject the Hadiths and who still call themselves Muslims. Edib Yüksel was born in Turkey, where he was a friend of the current president, Recep Erdogan. For some years he was an outspoken Islamist, but he now lives in the United States and has completely rejected the Hadiths as a distortion of Islam. I asked him how he became an Islamist in his youth. My father was a very well-known Sunni scholar. My mother's side, they were the leader of religious order. Basically, both sides, they were very influential and uh, religious. I was raised in that environment. And that time I was involved with Akin Jilar. Akin Jilar was the youth organization, religious uh, Islamist. Would you describe yourself as an extremist in those days? Uh, of course, I was uh, for Sharia. I wanted to have a revolution in Turkey like Iran, but I was not uh, for using force and violence. What made you change your mind? Uh, my mind changed. Uh, that time I, I translated uh, the work of Dr. Rashad Khalifa. He had a very original study on the Quran. And then after that, uh, I decided to communicate with him. I expected a guy like my father, but I was very disappointed in him. I found him that he was an infidel. He didn't believe in hadith and sunnah. We had uh, debates, and each time he would win. I found out that the Islam I was promoting had nothing to do with the Quran or with the message of Muhammad. And you became what you call a Quran-only Muslim? Yes. What does that mean? Quran alone means the only book for Islam, which is peacemaking, to be followed is the Quran alone. So you're basically denying the Hadith. You just want to concentrate on the Quran. Absolutely. Hadith is the source of evil in today's Muslim people. More than 1.6 billion people are handicapped, are doomed to ignorance and to polytheism and to barbarism because of the teaching of hadith and things. You have paid a very heavy price for your belief. I knew the risk. I knew that I will be excommunicated, there will be fatwa issued against me, and I will no more be a best-selling author. Forget about that. My life will be at risk. And my father was the first one who disowned me publicly, who wrote articles against me. Basically, I was condemned as a heretic. I passed through a lot of pain to question my religion. It's not easy. And, but they didn't have mercy. What did you say to people who would say to you that you can't really know about Islam without the Hadith? For instance, you wouldn't know that you had to pray five times a day. Th that's a good question. They created so much details, these uh, religious scholars, so many ridiculous rules they created. And through that, Muslims turn to robots. They are just following silly, formal rituals which has nothing to do with the message of Islam. Are you basically saying that the Hadith distorts the meaning of Islam? Hadith distorts and the Quran is enough, Quran is perfect, and the Quran is fully detailed. That was Edip Yuxal. Saib, is he a Muslim? Uh, yes, but a misguided one. He wants to throw out the baby with the bathwater. The Quran is the foundation of Islam. The Hadith are one of its structural elements. And if you start meddling with that, dismantling it, you actually demolish the whole structure. 
Jo Jonathan, is it true that the prophet said that nothing about him should be written down? No, it's not true. One of his companions said that early on, the prophet didn't allow his companions to write anything down except the Quran and a specific thing you say during the prayer. And then later on, he allowed them to start writing other things. In the beginning of Islam, people don't have copies of the Quran sitting around on tables and stuff. The Quran hadn't even been compiled into a book yet. So it was really hard to tell when something coming out of the prophet's mouth is the Quran versus his own words. So you can see there was concern about mixing the two bodies of, of material up. But then toward the end of his life, when he's an administrator and a judge and a statesman, then, then he allowed people to write things down. So how did you react to Edip's interview? Actually, I read his reformist translation of the Quran, and I think he's, um, I mean, he sounds like a very traumatized person. When you hear him say things like 1.6 billion people are condemned to barbarism and that they're robots, I mean, that's just not true. I mean, you, you could see some Muslim praying in Bangladesh and crying during the prayer who's deeply moved by what he's doing or some woman fasting in Bosnia and what that means to her. These people aren't robots. Things aren't dry rituals to them. So I think that's really unfair characterization. The second thing is that he doesn't succeed in doing what he says he's doing in his translation of the Quran because it's impossible to read or translate the Quran without relying on tradition outside the Quran. Because, for example, there's words in the Quran that have no, they don't exist anywhere else in the Arabic language except in the Quran. And the only way we know what they mean is by traditions in the Hadiths. And so I have actually read his reformist translation the whole way through. And sometimes there'll be things in the Quran where he says, oh, I don't have information for this, so I just have to leave it untranslated. But there's other things where he, he just goes and relies on Arabic dictionaries, classical Arabic dictionaries, and you go and look at that definition for the word in that dictionary, and what does it come from? A hadith. So he doesn't succeed in actually shedding this body of material that he thinks is so suspicious. But say, if for him the Quran is enough, what's wrong with that? For him personally, I mean, everybody can take a personal choice, but we've got to understand that Islam is a complete system, economic, social, judicious, and it's about finding the truth. It's not about uh, what suits you personally. We could all make up our own personal religion if we wanted to, but then we shouldn't be uh, calling it Islam anymore. Well, I think it's the nature of the beast. I mean, essentially, anything that could be established as having been voiced by the prophet of God it then immediately comes to possess the full terrifying force of eternal law. Now, we've had mention of the fact that the praying five times a day is not in the Quran. Now, that is a Zoroastrian practice. It seems to me entirely possible that that was smuggled into the Sunnah by Zoroastrian converts. What that means is that people now are still following Zoroastrian practice, but thinking that it is eternally from God. Equally, however, what Zoroastrian converts also seem to have smuggled in was the idea that apostates should be killed. That was a fundamental aspect of the Zoroastrian imperial system. And that Muslims can think, can argue from the hadiths that people who leave Islam should be executed seems to me a massive problem. And if we can start to look at how possibly, in historical terms, the Sunnah came into existence and we don't attribute it back to the prophet of God and then ultimately from God himself, then I think there is potential there to form a kind of Islam in which the very prospect of having to kill apostates is removed. Uh, so, Jonathan, so wait, I, I'm confused. Are you saying that the original Arab followers of the prophet, somehow a couple of Zoroastrians convert to Islam and then they come and say, hey, you guys, you know what? I, I think actually, weren't you guys supposed to pray five times a day? And they're like, oh, we, we don't remember that. We lived with a prophet for 20 years, well, it, but I think maybe we should start this. That's a, just a preposterous idea that somehow Zoroastrian converts to Islam convince all the other Muslims that they have to pray five times a day as an absolutely essential part of their religion, the one part that nobody disagrees on. I want to move on to some of the contemporary issues that we've just begun to touch upon because there is a sense in which uh, the extremists, the Salafis, the people who claim that they revere the successors of the prophet, want to purify Islam and they're doing that by using hadith to try to find an original Islam that will, will accept barbaric punishments. Is that a worry, Saeed? The idea that you could personally just go and handpick hadith to justify your own opinions is as worrying as what Tom has been doing by picking one or the other historic anecdote and building a whole system of interpretation of uh, Islam on it. Islam has various structural elements. There is the Quran, there is the Sunnah, the Hadith. In addition, there are the schools of thought. These are various uh, ways of interpreting the Quran and the Hadith and deriving from them legal rulings. And if you move away from that, if each individual thinks they are 
competent to read the mind of God or to understand the prophet without having to actually go through this rigorous process of examining the whole of the evidence, then that becomes very, very dangerous. But Jonathan, these people, the Taliban, the Islamic State, can turn to Hadith and can find justification within the Hadiths for their extremist behavior, their brutality. The Hadith tradition is, is absolutely vast. If you want to cherry pick evidence, you can find something to support pretty much anything. It's not that the Hadith tradition is enabling them to do this. It's their own kind of desire to find evidence. To but, but they it. would struggle to find justification for doing it in the Quran. Oh, that's, that's, that's just not true. Hadith. But I mean, I think this is one of the big, I mean, I actually wanted to comment on this. This is a big uh, canard here, which is that the idea that the Quran is somehow this uh, liberal 21st century document is, is nonsense. I mean, the Quran says that the thief will have his or her hand cut off. And it's only from the Hadiths that we know that you can't do this unless the person steals something that's above a certain value from a secure location, not out of necessity. The thing can't be any kind of food stuff. The person has to confess to have done it. That's all from the Hadiths. All these mitigating, moderating restrictions are from Hadiths. It's a sort of false dichotomy saying the Quran is sort of this document of moderation and the Hadiths provide the extremism. Tom? The classic example, I guess the single Hadith that has caused most anxiety would be one which describes Aisha, the favourite wife of Muhammad, marrying him at six, and then Muhammad consummates the relationship when she is nine. Totally People untrue. tended not to have a problem with this until quite recently, as underage sex has become ever more of a taboo. So this has provoked more and more anxiety among Muslim commentators, and various attempts have been made to solve it, either saying, well, this was the practice of the age, which is, of course, to relativise the prophetic model, or to say the chains of transmission by which we know this are unreliable, which, of course, I would absolutely agree, but again, that is to problematise the relationship, or possibly to go back and look at this hadith and to regard it not as a sort of a literal detail, not as a snatch of historical information telling us what the historical Muhammad did, but as something more symbolic, something more representative of the significance of Aisha within the Muslim tradition. It's the usual mudslinging that's going on here again. A careful reading of the Hadith. We find that Aisha was about five years younger than Fatima. That means uh, that uh, when she was betrothed to Muhammad, she must have been at least 10 years old. It was another four years before she moved over to his household, so the marriage wouldn't have been consummated until she was 14 or 15. So, so Bukhari this, is wrong. So where does the story of that she was nine when the relationship was consummated come from? Well, there are various reports, but this is the whole thing. In the you, canonical you don't, accounts you of Hadith, though, you don't they? Take I mean, they are, they are absolutely canonical. Jonathan? I think it's an authentic report. In fact, I think the scholar whose work does represent the state of the field in Western scholarship on Hadith, the German scholar Harold Motzke, if you were to take his methods of dating Hadith, I think you could date that report of Aisha back to actually about the time of Aisha. So I think What that, contemporary uh, report you're saying? Yeah, I think that's accurate report. I think even... From a non-Muslim perspective, it's a good argument that that uh, goes back to Aisha. So how do you reconcile this with your sense of modernity? Well, I reconcile it because nobody had a problem with this until like 1905. I mean, it was just not an issue. Even Western scholars writing about Muhammad in the 1800s, even uh, the 20th century just didn't care. But and I suppose I, the problem is that you're, you're using Muhammad as a moral exemplar. You're saying this is the person that we should follow. And he had sex with his okay, wife, Aisha, when she was nine years it's old. Very, I mean, well, Muslim scholars have been very clear about this. You cannot have sex with someone who is not physically able to have sex. Just because the Prophet did something doesn't mean Muslims have to do it. In fact, the Prophet himself, in another hadith, refused to marry his daughter to somebody who he thought was too old for her. Just because the Prophet did something, it means it's permissible in general. It doesn't mean you have to do it. And in fact, it also doesn't mean that you can't make very good arguments that it's bad policy. I mean, if you look today and you say, now people go to high school and they have ambitions of university degrees and they want to have careers in our day today, it might be very good policy for Muslims to say it's better not to marry until you're 16 or 18 years old. That's why if you look at most Muslim countries now have age restrictions that either are 16 or 18 years old. Tom? I mean, this is absolutely sort of illustrating the point that it is possible when you have hadiths that are generally held to be reliable, but by the moral standards, say, of a 21st century secular liberal society are regarded as rebarbative, it is possible to sort of essentially wash away the more unpalatable aspects of it. And that obviously has to be a process that I personally hope will carry on. But we also have to recognise that there are 
plenty of people out there who do still regard the fact that Mohammed slept with a nine-year-old as sanctioning them to do the same. And we have the evidence for that in the face of the captured Yazidi girls. That is what is providing the Islamic State with their sanction. So this is not a purely academic exercise. It is having a knock-on effect in the Middle East. Jonathan? This idea that somehow what's happening to Yazidi girls in Iraq is caused by the Hadith. An American soldier in Iraq was convicted by an American military court of raping and murdering an Iraqi child. And American soldiers sexually abused Iraqi children in Abu Ghraib prison. They, they, mean, probably they, went, they, they probably weren't saying that they were inspired no, no, but, by a religious no, leader. My, my, point is, my point is that this kind of action in warfare is not just the uh, purview of Muslims. No, no one is saying it is, but the issue is that Islamic State are sanctioning what they're doing. They are sanctioning slavery, execution, the rape of nine-year-olds by drawing on the hadith. I'm not saying that that is what every Muslim does. It's clearly not what has happened over the course of Islamic civilization. But the fact that it is possible to use hadiths in this way seems to me a problem. There's families in Iraq and families in Afghanistan that gladly marry their children off at young ages, not in a wartime and not in situations where the Islamic State is taking over. So, I mean, this is not just something that is being used by some extremist organization. This is part of the culture in those areas. But, Jonathan, do you not think it's a problem that people like Islamic State and Boko Haram in Nigeria can use a hadith as justification for the sexual abuse of their captives? I think the problem is that they are engaging in the practices. I don't blame a body of tradition that's been around for 1400 years for the decisions of some group that exists today. And I blame the people who use and abuse the law for those decisions. I don't blame the legal tradition itself. Well, we must bring this discussion to a close. But just before we do, Saeed, can I ask you, why does it matter if these stories in the Hadiths are true or not? Well, it matters a great deal because decisions are being taken. Is it allowed for me to use material from STEM research in a treatment for an ill patient? I go back to those sources. And so I need to know that these sources are reliable. Tom. Well, there's a Pakistani scholar, Fazla Rahman. He was aware of the problematic nature of the hadiths as a source. And he said that if all hadith is given up, what remains but a yawning chasm of 14 centuries between us and the Prophet? I think he's right. Jonathan. These things are important because Muslims, regardless of what people want to say, I mean, Muslims believe these things to be true and they have tremendous meaning for them. And unless you take them seriously and respect Muslim sensibilities, you can't really have a productive discussion with Muslims about these issues. Well, that's all for this week. My thanks to Tom Holland, Jonathan Brown and Saeed Blair. And Beyond Belief is off for a short break, but I'll be back again in the middle of August for more programmes on the place of faith in today's very complex world. I hope you'll join me.